a big part to understand treaties, uh, you've got this imagery of the crown, the imagery of the king or queen of the British Empire, was, which was projected to and explained to indigenous peoples that they're dealing with the top level of authority, they're dealing with the sovereign. And as I see it, that is part of conveying to indigenous peoples that their sovereignty, the sovereignty of indigenous peoples is being recognized. Of course, in a treaty, you've got two entities, two polities, two sovereign systems, two systems of law coming together. You couldn't have a treaty if it was just one side saying, I'll give you some power or I'll recognize you. It, it, by its very nature, treaties speak of international law and they speak of the entities taking part in treaties as recognizing each other. In this documentary, we are looking at some of the Aboriginal court cases here in Mi'kma'ki since the 1982 Constitution. It was a time of fierce lobbying, and um, and it was a, a historical and a very significant moment for Aboriginal people in this country. To have uh, the uh, highest law of the land, Constitution of Canada, recognizing and affirming Aboriginal people, and Aboriginal and treaty rights is a major, uh, I would have to say, a victory for Aboriginal people. It's not every country in the world that has that, and it certainly is a protection for the Aboriginal people in this country. What happened is over a lot of disagreement and not a whole lot of consensus, really. The, the federal government and the provinces agreed that they would go to the Imperial Parliament and get the power to change their constitution and create a whole new constitution. The Canada Act is the act that brings together the oldest constitution of the treaty with the uh, constitutional acts and then gives everyone the ability to work together to work out the rest of the constitution without the United Kingdom. So. The last act that the United Kingdom passed is the Canada Act, and they say they're not going to pass any more acts. It's up to the, can the Aboriginal people, the provinces, and the federal governments to work out their constitutional destiny without any more interference from London or England or anything like that. And so it's the last step in their liberation as a colonial people, and the first step in our creating a whole new relationship with them independent of uh, the treaties we signed with Lon in London, but directly uh, between the treaty holders like the Maoriomi uh, for the Mi'kmaqs and the provinces and the federal government. And that's the big task that everyone in invoked upon, but instead of trying to do it politically, they tried to uh, punish us, punish people who were exercising Aboriginal and treaty rights and saying they weren't rights. And the colonists took them to court um, first. And we had to defend and the, the courts reaffirmed to them that these things are constitutional rights and that there's a whole new order and that they have to negotiate this out. Before 1867, treaties are signed between the British Crown and Aboriginal people in what is now British North America. This is the area over which the British government claims sovereignty. And this included, for instance, Upper Canada, which is now Ontario, Lower Canada, which is now Quebec, as well as the Maritime Provinces, which would include, of course, PEI, New Brunswick, as well as Nova Scotia. Um, in each of these areas, the British government signed treaties with Aboriginal people uh, living in each of these areas. Um, in Nova Scotia, for instance, it was beginning in 1726 down until 1779. There's a treaty that was signed in the 1760s with uh, Aboriginal people in uh, what is now Quebec. And then there's a series of treaties uh, from 1784 down until 1850, which are signed between the British government and Aboriginal people in what is now Ontario. In these cases, the relationship is directly between representatives of the British monarchy and Aboriginal people, and this is important. In the post-1867 period, however, 
it is the federal government, the Canadian federal government, which signs a series of treaties with Aboriginal people. Because after 1867, it is the federal Canadian state which becomes responsible for Aboriginal affairs. The British government is no longer involved. Well, I think today most people think of the Crown as the, uh, like Crown prosecutors, for instance, the, uh, the lawyers to fight people in court and the late charges and to prosecute people. So I think a lot of people think the Crown is, uh, is really the opposition. I mean, they're the ones that, uh, that fight against people who, who are in court cases. <clears throat> but popularly, I mean, uh, the Crown is really the, uh, the head of government, and, and today in Canada, of course, it's the federal government and the provincial government, so uh, those are, in effect, Crowns as well. But then you can even go further. I mean, you, you need all kinds of Crown corporations, for instance, all across Canada, and they're Crown because they've been mandated by different government, uh, federal or provincial. So uh, Crown is, is different definitions. Um, I think the definition from the Mi'kmaq side is, uh, is the party who signed the treaties with us. And back in the 1700s, uh, the definition of Crown was pretty straightforward and simple. But today, of course, the whole idea of Crown is so fragmented and has so many different meanings, it's confusing. But, uh, I think for me, um, the Crown is our treaty partner. I see in the idea of the Crown, a constitutional monarchy, some very good ideas, some very sophisticated ideas. But of course, the reality that Native people set, see in Canada, in case after case, is that the Crown seems to always be in the position to say, oh no, you don't have any rights, or your rights were terminated somewhere in the past. Say a group wants to test uh, their right of fishing. Uh, say they take a case to court, as happened, for instance, in the Marshall case, when Donald Marshall Jr. was fishing for eels, and eventually it came down to the court saying, we'll, we'll look into the, the, hi the history and try to figure out what was promised. But the Crown, the representative of the Crown in a litigation like that, is on the other side of the case arguing, no, you don't have these rights. Sometimes we People think that the only reason to go to court is simply to win. But that wasn't the purpose. That's what happened, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to have our Aboriginal and treaty rights recognized. Uh, back in 1976, the, uh, the chiefs of Nova Scotia at the time submitted the paper to the um, government of Canada, and they called it the Aboriginal Rights Position Paper. And what they were looking for was for uh, the federal government to sit down at the table and begin discussing what those rights mean for Canada and for Mi'kmaq. And it was because they rejected that paper is why we began fighting all these court cases. But the whole purpose behind the court cases was to be able to sit down with the Crown, sit down with the government of Canada, and be begin discussing what these mean. What does the Treaty of 1752 mean? What do these eight clauses mean? Uh, how should they be applied today? So. When the Simon case was recognized, when Denny Powell Silboy was recognized, when Marshall was recognized, that simply, to me, brought us back to the starting line. That it simply brought us back to where we wanted to be in the first place, is to sit down with the government and say, uh, we have a clearly recognized right by the court. Let's sit down and discuss what it means. In 1985, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that James Matthew Simon had a treaty right to hunt. And, uh, that, that, was, that was recognized by the province, provincial government. And then uh, after that, well, there was quite an uproar when we, when we started to hunt. Everybody was all, all concerned that we were going to kill off all the animals in Nova Scotia, uh, especially the moose. The importance of Simon, uh, as it went to court, it was an interesting time because that was really around the time uh, in 1982 when Canada uh, amended the Constitution and they put in Section 35 uh, to the Constitution. And it was an acceptance uh, within the Constitution that existing treaty and Aboriginal rights had to be respected uh, and that they had to be implemented. It wasn't just enough that they were there, they had to mean something. And that federal and provincial laws 
uh, could not override those rights, that those rights had a more fundamental nature about them. In September 1999, six years after being charged with selling eels, Donald Marshall wins a landmark Supreme Court decision. The interesting thing about the Marshall case is following Simon, uh, because of some procedural ways that Simon went through, the courts left open a little clause that said, if in the future somebody should find historical evidence that indicates the Treaty of 1752 ceased to be valid or ceased to be a treaty, then that was still a possibility left open. The Crown, after Simon, spent 10 years of money and time uh, trying to find evidence that the Treaty of 1752 uh, was no longer an existing or valid treaty. So when we went through the Marshall case, at the beginnings of the Marshall case, that was the evidence the Crown was putting forward. Uh, not only did they want to um, invalidate the ability to sell uh, harvested materials, but they were looking this at this as a chance to reverse Simon, uh, to get rid of the treaties to begin with. Ultimately, a day came within the case where the Crown's own expert witness was on the stand and giving all sorts of testimony about how 1752 was invalidated by hostilities that happened and, and so forth. But then he said the, this phrase that just stuck with us all. The phrase that said, I just don't get what the problem is. Because in 1760 and 61, the Mi'kmaq and the Crown made treaties. And the Crown made treaties with all the Mi'kmaq. And within that treaty was the ability to take the harvested animals, plants, and fish and to trade them with the British. His only caveat was it had to be a regulated trade. But what he didn't realize is is that even under the Constitution, Section 35, uh, every right is a regulated right. So his point really drove home the idea that said, you know what, all of this stuff about the Treaty of 1752 doesn't make any difference because we know the Mi'kmaq have a covenant chain of treaties. And all of those treaties are important. And all of those treaties provide the right for Junior to do what he did. So at that moment, we changed our defense and said we're no longer relying on the Treaty of 1752 because we didn't want to see the Treaty of 1752 attacked in court. And we relied on the treaties of 1760 and 61. And we said those give Junior the right to do what he wants to do. And in fact, the Crown's own witness says that it gives him the right to do what he wants to do. And ultimately, in the Marshall case, the Supreme Court used that piece of testimony and they spell it out within the, uh, the decision itself, they use that piece of testimony to say, yes, Junior Marshall has the right uh, to sell what he caught. Within 30 days of the Marshall decision, the West Nova Fishermen's Coalition, an intervener in the Marshall case, filed a motion requesting a rehearing of the Marshall case. Usually what happens in a motion like that is the Supreme Court either says yes or says no. Uh, if it's saying yes, it would probably define a little bit about any aspects of the rehearing it wanted to identify. But instead of doing that, uh, the court said uh, all it was doing was uh, re-explaining what it already decided in Marshall 1. The problem with looking at it that way, uh, there's a couple of, of, uh, of uh, difficulties and it largely stems from the fact that in Marshall 2, when they tried to explain Marshall 1, uh, they described the, the treaties in question, that is, the series of treaties that were made by various communities and chiefs in 1760 and 1761, as being local treaties made with local communities with local territoriality. Well, if you took that as a logical extension, uh, Junior Marshall was from Cape Breton, uh, he was a member of the Member 2 community in Sydney. He was living near or at uh, the Wicogama community, also in Cape Breton. But his fishing activities were on the mainland of Nova Scotia in Pomaquit Harbor, uh, near the, uh, 
uh, Buckton Keck or Afton community. In other words, that he was outside the territory of Cape Britain. The Supreme Court didn't seem to focus on that issue, and if you took their words at face value, uh, Marshall was outside his territory and he should have been convicted instead of acquitted. So it doesn't make any sense. But also, you know, when, when the Supreme Court did this, they said, well, we're just re-explaining what was already happening in Marshall 1. But in, in doing so, they didn't give uh, an opportunity to us who were representing Marshall to uh, uh, argue or comment on anything that they were going to say uh, or what they saw as issues they wanted to talk about in Marshall 2. The other thing about what the Supreme Court did that was, I thought, somewhat bizarre is that in the original Marshall decision, Marshall 1, there was a series of uh, dissenting judges. That is, it wasn't a unanimous decision. But when they did the Marshall 2, the judges who were involved in Marshall 2 in deciding it included those who dissented in Marshall 1. In other words, uh, these were uh, people who were purporting to explain what the majority decided in Marshall 1, but they weren't part of the majority that they were purporting to explain. So that, that whole thing was somewhat bizarre. So on the negative side of, of Marshall 2, what they said that is uh, causing some problems uh, is that there were local treaties with local territoriality. On the good side of what they did in Marshall 2 is they explained the process of consultation in more detail that the Crown had to go through. And to cut to the chase about that, what they said in Marshall too, is that, well, the Crown can regulate, but in doing so, they must consult with the uh, treaty beneficiaries. And it was up to the Crown to propose any limits or restrictions that they thought were necessary. And uh, that is a process that has never been followed since 1999 when these decisions came down. The Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia have asserted Aboriginal title to the province of Nova Scotia. It's not a, an easy uh, topic to discuss because there's a lot of question that remains uh, that needs to be resolved about Aboriginal title uh, between the governments of uh, the province, provincial government, federal government, and the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. Things have happened in the past that uh, I think that continues to uh, strengthen the uh, positions and uh, the claims of uh, Mi'kmaq people, and uh, again in Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, a lot of that has to do with court decisions. There's been a number of decisions that have uh, really uh, affirmed and reaffirmed Aboriginal rights and um, treaty rights uh, for us in uh, Nova Scotia. And um, the most recent case, just recently, is the Williams case in uh, British Columbia. It has uh, reiterated the decisions that were made previously uh, uh, in the past uh, 10 or 20 years on Aboriginal title, that um, Aboriginal title does exist. It's the first case that really has come out and said it does exist in that specific area of British Columbia. And that for us, I think, is, um, is a major victory for us in Nova Scotia and I would say all other Aboriginal people in Canada. In every case involving Aboriginal people and mining companies or forest companies or fishing companies or provincial governments, there has never been any instance where the government of Canada, despite its constitutional obligation and fiduciary legal responsibilities to First, First Nations peoples, it has never ever stood on the side of First Nations in the courts ever. The thing that I have to say about the honor of the Crown is it is tied directly into truth. Truth and the honor of the Crown should be tied together. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Federal Crown, uh, truth is not one that we often associate with the honor of the Crown. We've seen all too much is the dishonorable conduct on behalf of Crown actors when dealing with First Nations. I'll give you an example. Um, when we 
say that we're indigenous peoples um, from from the area, um, their their response is well, we're not sure that you do exist. In order for you to exist as Mi'kmaq or as Dene or Haida or as Cree, you have to prove that you do exist. And in order for that to happen, you have to go to the courts of our country to demonstrate that in fact there is evidence to support that you are one of these peoples. And that's a fundamental denial of human rights, but that is the premise upon which the Crown operates. Based on that, they also deny that we have any rights whatsoever, whether it's to hunting or to fishing or to the resources of our territories, whether it's minerals or timber or water resources. Um, their usual argument is that we have to prove in the court that we have used these territories um, from time immemorial. So that's an expensive process involving countless numbers of people, elders, countless numbers of dollars, countless hours and days I mean, preparing for and going through the trials and then going through appeals after that. But when we deal with the honor of the Crown, that's, that's where we end up. Um, when push comes to shove, um, it, it becomes a nasty situation. 2013, Chief Teresa Spence went on a hunger strike in Ottawa. Her calls to the Governor General as the Queen's representative went unheard. We ask, what is the role of the Governor General today? So yes, one time the Governor General was a very important political person in Canada. Um, and I suppose uh, there, was a, there was an argument years ago about the Queen, about First Nation leaders during the constitutional talks kept trying to bring this issue personally to the attention of the Queen, and they weren't successful, they went to court. And, and now people want to bring that to the Governor General and the Lieutenant Governor, but um, in some ways I respect that because people want to go to the proper authority, the one in charge, but uh, I think today we have to recognize that uh, things have evolved, things have changed. Uh, uh, the Queen is largely symbolic, uh, people have a hard time hearing that, but that's true. I mean, she really has no day-to-day um, -day powers in the Commonwealth or individual countries. Um, the Governor General of Canada, great man he is, but still, you know, uh, he's not the Prime Minister uh, and he doesn't uh, control the, the policies and the things that happen in this country and so I say that his role is largely symbolic. And so we, the court has given us the step that we asked it to do. We asked it to enforce the treaties. We asked it to protect us from the Crown, and they did. Now, whether the Crown's going to live up to the court's expectation is going to be difficult. But we've entered into a whole new era of, of a sovereignty that's based on dialogue and discussion and collaboration and consent again, instead of them forcing something down our throat. This will not stop them from trying to force things down our throat. But it gives us the power to stop it. And that's all the power we really want, is the ability to stop things that are bad for us, that we haven't consented for. And give us the power to develop in our children this new power of consent and this new power of dialogue among equals holding constitutional rights. The whole basis of the court case was it recognized that we had a constitutional right um, under Section 35, the treaty right to trade. And that particular right, even though it was recognized by the court, was never, ever, ever admitted to or acknowledged by, let alone recognized by, the federal government. And it's astounding. I mean, it's hard for Mi'kmaq people to say, well, we've won this in court, and yet you go about pretending it never happened, it never existed. And that's hard. That's really hard to take as a Mi'kmaq person. And here in Member 2, that's hard. So yes, we have fishermen here that make a good living from the commercial fishery as a result of Junior, but you still have this big hollowness because 
he achieved a huge victory for all Mi'kmaq people, all First Nations people in Canada, and yet it's been ignored. And that's the hard part. In the uh, late 70s, when the uh, Union of Nova Scotia Indians presented the position paper to the federal government, uh, asserting a uh, claim on their land claims and, uh, and uh, Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title, um, it was rejected by the federal government. It was rejected on the basis that it was superseded by law. Thirty years later, now, we had to resort to the courts, and the courts have changed all of that. And I think today, if that paper were to be presented again, it would be treated and viewed a lot differently in a much more positive way by the governments of the day because there is no basis on rejecting that paper today. And to my mind, I will always believe that Marshall II was A, a unique scenario in, in uh, Canadian jurisprudence, and I think a mistaken scenario in, in Canadian jurisprudence. But we're stuck with it because it is a Supreme Court decision. And as we found out in subsequent cases, like the Joshua Bernard case and, and Stephen Marshall logging case, when the Supreme Court says something, other courts have to follow what the Supreme Court says. Uh, and uh, whether you agree with it or not, is is irrelevant because that's what the courts have said. The one part that still lingers on from the Marshall decision and from um, the agreements that were made as part of the Marshall Response Initiative uh, is that there is still today in Nova Scotia no fishery that meets the criteria of the Donald Marshall case. That is, there is no category in the fisheries regime for the Mi'kmaq to engage in fishing for a moderate livelihood. The Mi'kmaq can fish for food, social, and ceremonial purposes. The Mi'kmaq, in part, can fish under communal commercial licenses for commercial purposes, but the livelihood fishery, according to Marshall, is something different, and there is no livelihood fishery in 2014 uh, operating here in Nova Scotia. And the final thing at the moment to, to say is, despite the fact that uh, Mr. McKenzie, in negotiating these uh, Marshall Response Initiative agreements, had no mandate to deal with rights, today uh, we're being told that the benefits that were provided under those agreements, the fisheries access, etc., count towards a moderate livelihood. So it's a very strange position, I think, to be in when you enter into agreements that are without prejudice to your rights, when you enter an agreement with, through someone who has no mandate to deal with rights, uh, to be told that what you did agree to and the access that was provided counts towards meeting your modern livelihood. After 30 years, I don't think there's much improvement for, for our people. Even though we, we go to court, we went to the Supreme Court of Canada and proved to them that we, we have rights. They continue to ignore those rights. Uh, they ignore the, the rule of law. They ignore the honor of, of their words to our treaty, their ancestors' words to our treaty. They completely ignore them. And our ancestors' words, they completely ignore them. So we're left to say that the honor of the crown and the rule of law in many cases doesn't apply to Aboriginal people.